Hello, welcome. Uh, we are uh, very excited today to have uh, Patrick Rothfuss with us, the author of the King Killer Chronicle, starting, of course, with uh, The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear. And he is about to release his new novella, The Narrow Road Between Desires, which will be released on November 14th, 2023. Um, thank you so much, Patrick, for agreeing to do this interview with us here at Grimdark Magazine. And uh, my name is John Morrow, and uh, Beth. <laughs> hey, um, I'm Beth Tabler, and I am the editor of the Grim Dark Magazine issues, quarterly issues. And I'm also the owner of Before We Go blog, magazine, and review team. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we're all big fans on, oh. on both sides. So this is. This, this is, is a dream come true for us. Oh, yeah. that, that's, pretty, that's, that's pretty so. We're going to try and hold down the gushing, not to make you uncomfortable, you know. You know but... The truth <laughs> is, um, what happened? I just rent, went to the Ren Fair um, with my boys. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, oh, God, I'm starting off as old man Rothfuss. I went to the Ren Fair back in the day. Um, and it was fine. But, you know, it wasn't it was it was fringy you know um and but it was fun and everyone there was enjoying themselves but uh i went this time and it was so much bigger and it's so much more everything than it used to be and as we were leaving um you know we hadn't had a chance to see everything but there was a a, a sword stall and i stopped and and i was walking through and and the boys were like, oh, and they wanted to look in there. So we stopped and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, look, you know, that blade is kind of bluish. Mm -hmm. And and I'm and I ask a question, and one of my boys asks a question, and um, and, and it was they they make me proud every day, but uh he's like, What's that? He goes, Well, that's a kopesh, that's an Egyptian sword. Mm -hmm. And I think my boy said, So why is it iron? <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> <laughs> and and he's like, you're right. They didn't have iron back then. And then my boy's like, well, they did, but it fell from the sky. And and I'm like, <laughs> oh boy, if there's a gene for pedantry, he he, you know. But then it, we were talking for a while, and also this guy was down for it. He's like, you're right. And we talk about meteorites. We talk about tempering steel. We talk, you know. And my boys are just having a great time there in general. And then the guy looks at me. He goes, you know, you look a lot like my favorite author and i said who's that and he goes pat rothfuss i go oh i get that a lot and he goes oh yeah and then the, his, the other person working the booth is like who's that it's like oh it's a fantasy guy and whatever i go i go to, to be and sometimes i use that to sort of sidestep the interaction because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not a lie but i'm out with my kids and yeah. you know i'm just tired and i haven't had coffee yet in the day and and I go, I go, to be fair, I get it a lot because I am Pat Rothfuss. And he's like, and then almost immediately he starts to apologize. He's like, sorry, I'm just kind of excited. It's like, this is, and I immediately flash back. Wow, look at this. I'm telling a story in a story. Um, Very meta. <laughs> instead of answering a question. Sounds familiar. Is, <laughs> buckle up. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and I tell him the truth. I go, hey, man, everybody's a geek for somebody, you know? And like, I would feel so bad if there, if, if I met a person and, and there was, and they never, and they couldn't think of somebody that they would have a problem meeting and being cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, honestly, it's in the past, it's been Neil Gaiman, mm -hmm. where I, I even yeah. know him a little bit. Like we've met at cons, um, you know, and now it's to the point where when I, when I get to rarely like hang out with him, only about 60% of my brain is focused on like not freaking out and embarrassing myself where it used to be like 85%. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I, I remembered way back my very first signing out in Seattle and this young girl 
comes up. And it, we, I had never done like a book tour. It was the first stop on Wise Man's Fear. And like 600 people showed up and nobody expected it. And I signed books for like until two in the morning. Um, and it was a hoot. But everybody came up one at a time and she came up and I, I remember she was 14. I know that because she came up and she was just like bouncing and she goes, and she goes, and she'd been in line for like three hours as well. And she's like, I'm 14. She goes, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me in my whole life. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, oh, it gets so much better than this. <laughs> like, like, oh, sweetie, that is the, that is so sweet. Oh, like Only up from here, baby. <laughs> there's like so many. I'm so happy for all the things you have yet to experience that's cooler than this. But the reason I remember that isn't just that it was so sweet. And she felt no shame in being excited. Mm -hmm. But because I, I, I like doing signings, I like meeting my readers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can remember like a big, like big guy, like six, six, whatever, like built might've had like Marines t-shirt mm -hmm. on or whatever. And, and he like puts his book down and he's kind of like, and then, he, but, and he's like the fucking hands shaking. This is fucking stupid, you know? And, and <laughs> cause he was embarrassed, you know? And I'm like, hey, man, like, you know, and I, that might have been the first time I said, like, we're all a geek for somebody. Like, and, I, and then I told him the story about how I really embarrassed myself in front of Colin Malloy, you know, and and so th this is a long way of me saying, um, I feel like I should be sort of cool about the whole thing, too, because and then when I I'm like up your collar. You know, yeah, I would, I would. No, that's Fonzie cool, which is like actively cool, where <laughs> real cool implies that like, oh yeah, you don't care. This is all the same thing. And when I thought like, if I'm a writer, I want to be a cool writer. And I imagined like, what would Neil Gaiman be like? Mm -hmm. it, and, and then I, and so I imagined that like people would come up and they're like, oh, I love your books. And they'd be like, Oh, yeah, that's great. You know, I'm so happy for you. And just kind of like, not blasé, but like peaceful and kind of like accepting. And instead people come up to me and they're like, oh, I love your books. Like that part where you, and I'm like, yeah, I, I like that part too. <laughs> I'm like, no, oh man, I was going to be cool. No, I'm. We can geek out together. Yeah. Oh, man, so you, like. You, make that, you made a good memory with that person though. Yeah. Like, Absolutely. Oh my God. Pat totally geeked out. With <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what I should be as an author, but I. Uh, but I can't be anything other than what I am. So like, don't, don't be, uh, don't ever feel, I'll, I'll say this, Hey, you out there in the future, never feel bad about loving something. Like there's too little of that in the world. I like, like, who do you want to be like that big bra dude who like really was beating himself up for being excited. Like, <laughs> Uh, yeah, here's the clip quote that's going to get pulled out. I want to be that 14 year old girl that's like, <laughs> this is the best thing. And like, there's no shame. There's no hesitation. There's no fear because like being excited is a type of vulnerability. You know, mm -hmm. love is vulnerability. Man, that's harder and harder to do the older you get. But, but no, I, I'm delighted and I'm pleasantly surprised that you mentioned that you, you dug this stuff. So I actually, I think yeah. getting older, at least for me personally, getting older, I give less fucks. I, I I'm used just to gonna do what I'm going to do. I, I have a lot of friends that have walked that direction. Unfortunately, like I am a recovering 20, 20 year old white guy. <laughs> and like, I, I, I experienced that most delicious of all drugs is like walking through the world and knowing that I was safe and that everything was made for me. And which meant kind of corresponding, like everything I do is right and everything's fine. And I don't give a shit either. Ha ha. What a rebel. And now my pendulum has swung all the way back. 
And it's like, now I have only fucks, you know, <laughs> I'm composed, composed entirely of fucks and it's awful. Like it, I'm <laughs> paralyzed with the potential import of my action and decision. I, I, I hope it circles back again and I can get to where you are. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm I'm just uh, I used to carry a little book around that had it was it had a list of all the science fiction and fantasy books that I wanted to read. I would carry it around like my little Bible in oh. my purse. So every time that I went to a bookstore, I'd I'd be like, okay, these are the ones that I want. Dang. Dang. Oh, I'm on a I, I have a Lord of the Rings tattoo. I am on a bash <laughs> like oh man. I have if that's more organized than I've ever been about anything in my life, what you just described. <laughs> so, um, yeah, could you take us back maybe to your own childhood too? So yeah, I think you made a great point about um, the wisdom of, of children and, and having that childlike um, attitude, embracing excitement. Um, tell us about yourself when you were a, a boy growing up. How did you get into reading and fantasy and ultimately start writing boy that is that's a good open-ended question um <clears throat> i could i could take that in a bunch of directions i guess i'll say um i'll take this angle <clears throat> um because i could tell the story it's like oh i was born in wisconsin but my dad would manage hotels. So I moved around a little bit mm -hmm. and then it's sort of like, Oh, you know, rootless, you know, and, you know, couldn't make many friends, didn't stay in one place. You get one vibe off that, you know, and it's like, but the worlds that I could count on were in books. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's true, um, but it would be a good story. Right. And I, it, it would be implied just by sharing that little snippet. Mm -hmm. Um, but the truth is, when I was going to start going to school, uh, my parents did me an incredible kindness and they settled down in one place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it could also be that they were tired of moving, too, to be fair. But um, it was out in the country. I had like a 40 minute bus ride to get mm -hmm. to, to school. And my mom liked books and read to me and I liked books um and I, I guess I could say my mom would read me picture books mm -hmm. and uh did you know there's a limit to how many books you can check out from a library yes it's 50 <laughs> right I learned when I was a kid <laughs> because I would go into the library and I'm like I want all these picture books and and I remember it like they would actually like take a almost a picture of them using this old machine that had a crank on it. And, but like 50 picture books is an afternoon and then I'm and done. And my bad. mom's right. And my mom's like, I can't take you. I can't drive <laughs> you to the library every day. Um, And so, she, but she was smart. And so I remember we went to the mall and there was a Walden books, right? Oh, everybody out there of a certain Walden age. Books. I remember <laughs> books. Did you guys have the Other Worlders Club? No. If you were a member of the Other Worlders Club, it was a little card and you got 10% off all science fiction and fantasy. It was for kids. Where where was this? In Walden <laughs> Books. It was part of Walden <laughs> in the local mall. But we went there and my mom brought out the box set of um the narnia chronicles mm -hmm. and she said you know these are kind of more grown-up books but i think you might be ready for them like good salesmanship because i had resisted the leap to chapter books because i want right. them pictures and so that's how i got my actual start it started there and then into dragon riders mm -hmm. and then the hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so like the, the, the cornerstones right off the bat, but you know, what was I like? Um, I'm trying to sort my head out these days and viewing my past through the lens of now, some things make better sense, but like, I, I wasn't, 
I didn't get on with the other boys. You know, I, I played with the girls and in the little school that I went to, honest to God, pumpkin hollow school, um, a little old brick schoolhouse where there was less than a hundred students each with like a first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. So four teachers, the lunch lady and the aide, Miss Otto. That was the first four years of my life out in the country. And um, I didn't get the other kids. And for the and I liked hanging out and playing with the girls because mm-hmm. they were better at talking. And uh but other than that little bit of socialization, I was at home and I, I like to read books. Eventually, like 10 years later, some kid moved into my grandpa's old house up the hill. And those were the only neighbors I had, you know. Um, um, and he came down and he knocked on the door of my house, which was baffling. Like, nobody knocks on your door like occasionally a package got delivered and that was it so it's summer i'm home i hear a knock on the door i go look like what is this noise in my house and he's standing there he's moved from a suburb and he's there and he's like hey hey you want to you want to do something and i'm like what why are you at my fucking house (laughs) and he goes you want to do something and i'm like i was doing something i was reading a book you're ruining it. You're like, you're interrupting me. I didn't, um, he's like, you want to go play? And I'm like, what do you even mean? So it was a novel a day through the entirety Mm -hmm. of my childhood. Even when I was, if two, if it was like in Eddings and they were short, um, all the way through high school and until I left for college. Although I did eventually make a couple of friends, you know? So about a, about a decade ago, I saw you do a, a talk on Princess and uh, oh, Mr. The, the Princess and Mr. Wiffle. Yes. <clears throat> um, it was in Portland. Okay. 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 I I don't think you would remember, but yeah, I saw you do the talk on this. And you had mentioned that one of your big inspirations was uh, Peter Spiegel. Oh. And I was wanted to ask you why, why is he such... Why is the last unicorn such a uh, an inspiration? So as a novel, not to quibble, uh, although, and then he said immediately beginning to quibble. Um, <laughs> I I love the last unicorn beyond words ability to express. Um, I, I won't go so far as to say it's the perfect book, but it is. It's an amazing book. And it's my favorite book and it's, it has been for a long time. And if anyone asks like, you know, Hey, I'm looking for a book to read. So easy. Bang. Mm -hmm. Last unicorn. Read it to my boys twice. I'm in the middle of my third read to them. Um, That said, I love the word inspiration. Um, I love the concept, you know, in spiritus to like, to have something imbue you, you know, with power or excitement. Uh, but I don't, I, I, I always draw back from the, you know, saying something inspired me there, uh, probably because I have have like weird oppositional defiant things, or maybe like, uh, just sort of iconoclastic tendencies. I, it's an amazing book. Um, and, and if anyone's watched and, and you're like, oh, I remember there was a cartoon, right? And it's like, read the book. If you read fantasy, the reason anyone gives a shit about unicorns right now is because that book got written by Peter S. Beagle when he was like 22, he was 22, it was 1960. It was his first book. He wrote it in a year. Fuck that dude. Right? Like this amazing magical book. You know, this this stunning book that I read a page of, like it's the Tao Te Ching, I read a page of, and there's some sentences in there that I close the book and be like, if you love words, like you love good writing. Um, but I, I do I do know 
what you're talking about. I don't know if I can remember the only specific time in Portland I can remember. I was doing a, a duo thing with Gail Carriger, but I know I've been there a couple other times. Um, yeah, I've got. Oh, I've hold had, on. It was. I've uh, forgotten. I've oh got man, you've got two number copies. two. Yeah, um, copies somehow. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the the princess number two has been out of print for a while. Um, but um, I. I, in reference to that, I, you know, I went to see Peter uh, at a, on a panel uh, at a WorldCon at one point, and somebody said da 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 the last unicorn because he's written a bunch of other stuff, including arguably one of the first works of urban fantasy, uh, a find in private place uh, where ghosts fall in love, and if that ain't urban fantasy, right, then I don't know what is. Um. And he mentioned The Last Unicorn and he said, you know, he goes, that book was exhausting. He goes, it was so hard to write. And if I knew what I was doing, I never would have tried to write it. And I'm glad I never have to write it again or something like that, which is not what you want to hear about your favorite author, favorite mm -hmm. book. But, and then he said, he goes, and I realized, and, and he either said, it was because he was either trying or eventually he realized, he said, I was writing a fairy tale that was also satirizing fairy tales. And he said that, and I went, that's exactly what it is. It is the thing, but it is also aware of what it is. And it's lovingly, it, it's not being a farce of, it's satirizing, which is much more delicate, much more sharp. Um, you know, a, a farce, farce is a fart, you know? Um, but satire is like a funny knife you can stab somebody with over and over again. Um, but he said that, and I went, it is. And that's why I love it, because it is both of those things at once. It's... It, which means it's really three things, you know? And then I realized that the name of the wind was effectively like heroic fantasy that was also satirizing. I, I wish there was a better word. It's not quite satire, but it's, it's, it's also subverting. Ugh, that sounds grossly, you know, ostentations, but it's, it's making fun of heroic fantasy tropes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and the, the princess and Mr. Wiffle, that is a kid's book that is playing off the expectations of yes. a children's book. It is really not a kid's book. Really, you know, really. I've, I have always said that. And like, oh. everyone's like, I read it to my kids and they love it. Because <laughs> the truth is like the old grim fairy tales, people are like, these were never meant for children. That's correct. They were meant for everybody. Mm -hmm. And and they went through, you think it's hard to get published now? Those stories, those old folk and fairy tales went through a publishing process more rigorous and impenetrable than anything anyone has to deal with today because your story only survived if somebody found it good enough to remember and mm -hmm. tell again. And so these are like, like smooth stones that have been tumbled through the culture for hundreds of years. And people repeat them because they find them psychologically fulfilling. They, 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 they're, they're nutritive to us. We, we cling to them in some way and you can't like, Nobody is fucking telling and retelling the water babies, you know, like uh, like a, 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 a like a story that is just horrific and everyone makes fun of. It's when people are like, "Hey, there's money in this kids doing fairy tales game, and so let's do it." And then you get you get some of the classics like Little Mermaid, but everyone like chocks them full of oh like overt morality and a bunch Sweetness of weirdness and mm -hmm. she and turns into foam she, it's like, it, it, it's so gross it's so yeah, gross dark yeah um <laughs> but uh and and some of these older stories 
like, how about this? A lot of the, the, the fairy tales that people did later, like purpose built fairy tales, they're like sort of by committee. You know, Disney is actually following a tradition. It didn't start the tradition. It's like, how about let's stamp out some pap for the masses and, mm-hmm. and turn a buck. But these old stories like The Frog Prince, I read it recently and it goes all through and it's full of things that no one would ever put purposefully put in a story because they don't serve any purpose. They're not adhering to a theme. There's no theme. It was a cool story and it reflected mores and values and, and things that we, we want in narrative. And then at the end, they're married and they're happy and they get in the carriage to leave. And the carriage is driven by a man who had an iron band around his heart because his child had died and it broke his heart and the dwarves put an iron band around it. So he had the strength of three men, but he could no longer feel the end. And I'm like, what the fuck? The carriage guy? Fuck this toad. Who the hell is this? Tell me about, he's just driving a wagon. Don't throw me something like that. So many questions. (laughs) I have so many questions. Nobody writes a story and puts the best character. It's like, by the way, he's driving the wagon. It's like it's like a Nick Fury cameo at the end of, <laughs> of an Avengers movie. And you're like, oh, wait, that's the actual thing that I wanted. I don't give a shit about <laughs> Thor anymore. Uh, well, okay, what was your question again? I've totally lost the thread. <laughs> that's going to be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> um, the Last um, Unicorn, very good book. Peter Beagle, <laughs> lovely man. Uh, you were talking about Princess and Mr. Wilfil. Is there going to be yeah. a third book? Please tell me there's going to be a third book. Oh, that's a complicated question. Um, a third Buy princess the book. Get out of that. <laughs> uh, a third princess book. Uh, eventually, maybe. Okay. Um, the, I, I enjoyed writing them. Uh, Nate Taylor is one of my absolute favorite people and one of the few people to like willingly work with me several times in a row. <laughs> Anybody works with me once, it's like, ooh, back to your office. <laughs> And then it's like, like, and they shake the dust from their feet as they leave that place and do not look back. (laughs) But Nate and I do this stuff together and it turns out amazing. You know, he illustrated Slow Regard. Yeah. And he illustrated. um, We were going to ask you about that. Yeah, the the illustrations are beautiful on Narrow Road. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I tagged him in for this saying... um, saying hey you know maybe you know 15 20 illustrations maybe a dozen 18 he has what like 30 oh for 40 <laughs> 40? over 40 so and, and there's so many that we yeah. got part way into and we're like mm-hmm. no we're gonna have to leave this one go mm-hmm. um and and every and i'm the sort of mom i t- i will take an illustration through like 20 iterations you know or nate will draw it and i'm like oh that's beautiful but but i do need it blue and everyone facing to the left actually which you can do with the 3d model but not with mm-hmm. 2d illust- it means it's effectively do it all again and he has never once choked me or or shot <laughs> me or kicked me directly into the sun um <laughs> um and and often if he adds something, it's something that I'm usually angry that I didn't think of first, Mm -hmm. you know, because he gets my aesthetic and he's stunningly versatile. I'm going to stop saying nice things about Nate Taylor because I'm always desperately worried that somebody else is going to come in and drop a truckload of money on him. And I won't be able to afford to work with him anymore. (laughs) Um, But yeah, a third princess book would be lovely. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I I have, I think what would happen is you would probably, I feel like the parents would have to be in that one, but I I don't have a story yet. I had a story for number two. Uh, The first story I told is a bedtime story to my then girlfriend 
you know? Uh, and so I told it as a joke and it was funny and I remembered it the next day. And that's where that started. And then five years later, I did it as a little side project, but um, I'd need to, the idea to kind of hit me before I, mm -hmm. before I did a third one. Wow. I started so, reading it to my eight-year-old. How many endings did you go to? I had to stop. Good. We, we, we got not pretty far she's like mom <laughs> get, get the first get to the first ending and you're fine you stop second ending yeah. I, I i read the whole thing to brian brushwood's kid and she was horrified and looked me dead in the eye she was like 11 looked me dead in the eye and she is what and started to cry and like said, what's, why would you That's do that? Fine. And left. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm a guest in this guy's house. <laughs> and she had read the name of the wind and she loved it. And, and I'm like, oh, I've got something you might not have seen before. And I, and I'm like, and he's like, it's, it's okay. And I'm like, it's really <laughs> not okay. I made your kid cry <laughs> with a story. And he, and he's like, it, it, and so like, I'm sweating remembering it. He, um, but no, uh, so some kids absolutely they'll love it the most um if your kids are a little gentler a gentler and sweeter yeah she's a little gentler and a little yeah. sweeter and man preserve that though that book will be there later yeah. but once once that sweetness goes away it's hard to get that back <laughs> it gets jaded to the world yeah <laughs> uh so you had mentioned it, you you are mentioned in the inspirational reading section of D. &D. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I know that you have quite a history with D and D and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about how much that meant to you. You know, that's, that's, that's like leveling up in life. That was, that was geek. That's geek level. That was a stunner. That was a stunner because, you know, um, I started going to cons when, uh, um, you know, at first to just get the lay of the land. I, I used to go to Gen Con because that was the con my friends knew about. Mm -hmm. And that was gaming and D&D. &D. Um, but I didn't know there were other cons, you know, but like I didn't know about fandom, honestly. Um, <clears throat> and the fact that kind of convention started with science mm -hmm. fiction and fantasy, you know. But once I got published, I started going to the cons and um, they were mostly writer cons like uh, World Con and World Fantasy and, um, uh, you know, most of those. And then I got an invitation to go hang out at PAX in Seattle. That's neat. Which, well, and it was most, oh, no, it wasn't even PAX. It was, I knew a couple people. They were doing a little ancillary stage show outside of PAX and they're like you want to just swing by do a little bit you know at this little theater uh like 150 and I'm like hell yeah um and what happened and this is embarrassing but um my editor Betsy Wolheim the only reason anyone knows who I am Betsy um was up for the Hugo for best editor um and I'm like cool because the Hugos are on Saturday night. And then on Sunday, I'll hop a plane and I'll go and I'll do this show Sunday night over here. Turns out that year, the Hugos were on Sunday night. So I'm like accidentally double booked myself. And even though I'd been her huge advocate for the Hugos, because, well, for every conceivable reason. And then like, I wasn't there when she won. <laughs> and so, and instead I'm in a little like off site, like, six blocks away dinner theater they serve good thai food there and i'm goofing off with these other guys but i i go from world con into pax and i gotta say i love my people i love world con i love those but those are ancient conventions you know and honestly a lot of these people were the groundbreaking social progressives of their day you know, 60 years ago, and they have clung to power like everyone does. And and it's an old con and with and and full of old people. And I say that as now I no matter how you shake it, I'm an old person. 
and it was fun. And I never thought about it until I went to PAX and I'm like, there's kids here and not just some people bringing their kids. It's like teenagers are here running around, goofing off mm -hmm. in this. And there's this festival atmosphere at this con. And I'm like, everyone's delighted. And I'm like, this is interesting. So I eventually got invited to play D and D with them um, on stage, which 14 year old me would never believe. Right. Who played the, the, when I left Pumpkin Hollow, I was on the lowest rung of the social ladder because uh, I went to a different school and I saw kids playing D and D in the garage or in, in the uh, gymnasium during uh, when it would rain, you know, instead of it being on the playground. So it's fifth grade and they they're hunkered down and they've got like dice and they've got graph paper and I go, I'm like, what you doing? And they're like playing a game. I'm like, what is it? And they're like Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, it's dragon. And I'm like, can I play? And they say, no. <laughs> and this is 1984. He said, and all <laughs> anyone knows about D&D is if you play it at, at best, you're a sociopath, but probably you worship the devil. Yeah, and the satanic panic, right? Yeah, that's what yeah. I was told when I was a kid. I wasn't allowed to play it because it was satanic. Yeah, right? Well, and the Tom Hanks's first movie, Mazes and Monsters, showed a bunch of college kids playing in tunnels. And they go, he ends up in an asylum, right? And that's what people knew about Dungeons and Dragons. And so, but, and so these kids, this was not me not, making the cut for the football team. <laughs> this was the kid, the, the people who like to read would beat these kids up, the mm -hmm. D&D &D kids. <laughs> and the D&D &D kids didn't want to be associated with me. And so it's like way down here. Uh, but I read the books and all of that. And then eventually they say, we're going to do this stage show because I was replacing Will Wheaton of all people at their four person game. And it was up on a stage in a theater in front of a thousand people. And then as we kept playing together over the years, like it was in the opera hall, like 8,000 people and it, and they packed it. They had to turn people away. And then like a quarter million would watch it online afterwards. And, and it was so much fun. It was so much fun, mostly because the, the DM was Chris Perkins who head of story at DD, &D, delightful human being and superlative dungeon master um who's just will roll with anything haha -ha. um <laughs> but uh it, it was such a joyful thing and it was such sort of like you wish you could send a little note back in time and say hey it's man you're you're gonna you're gonna eventually be able to play with people and this will be cool. <laughs> Other people later will think this is as cool as you think it is now. Um, and But that was also before 5th edition came out. And so we're tinkering with some of the rules. And, and I'm talking with people in D&D &D about like their new system and what they're doing. And then I, I come in playing, you know, because Will Wheaton did like a very serious elf character and he made up some of the elven language and he's an actor, you know? And I'm like, I can't, I can't follow that. So I'm like, swashbuckle, I'm going to, I'm going to play this game and I'm going to be a flip wizard and I'm going to have a high charisma <laughs> and I'm just going to make jokes um, and, and dash around and be charismatic and, uh, my character, by the way, not me, Pat Rothfuss. I can't flip. And uh, <laughs> and then for one of the games, they're like, you know, hey, we made a subclass for you. Oh, it's the duelist. Or rather, they made a subclass. And it's like, well, here you go. Because it seemed to do a lot of things that my character was trying to do. And I looked at it. And I'm like, oh, this is this is pretty cool. Oh, you know, I, I think I will stick with the, the one I'm doing right now. I didn't know that they had kind of made it for me to model after my play style. Mm. And, and I'm like, and so it's sort of like they had given me this gift and I'm like, 
yeah, cool. Thanks. You know, and I, <laughs> I'm over here. I'm like, now nah, I'm good. I, I like this build better. And then later when they put that in there, I, I could see uh, the, somebody said, you know, oh, you, you make bards cool. And I'm like, no, like bards, bards were never that cool, but musicians are cool, you know? And, but I could see some of the fingerprints of name of the wind, some, some little marks of how they built the new bards. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a way to kind of bring bards in, in a way, instead of having music just be magic, like give these people social power. You know, like that's what makes musicians cool. That's what makes, well, imagine if you are a rock star, a movie star, and also the head of the local newspaper. Like that's what a bard should be, you know? And like that person is terrifying in a different way. You know, they're not going to stab you, but you'll wish that you were dead after they get done with you. Um, so no, it was just the coolest thing that that they gave that nod to the books in DD. I was I was over the moon. Yeah, that's that's certainly huge geek cred. That's that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So this next question actually comes from my daughter, who's also a big <laughs> fan. Um, she says, You write so poetically in a style that feels both modern and timeless. Hmm. Um, how do you get in the right mindset to create such artistic prose? Do you visualize the scenes in your mind like in a movie, or do you have some other approach? I'd love to snip that out and put that on the back of the book. Uh, they are way more articulate and they're better at that than I am. How old are they, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, so my daughter's 17, actually. Hey, yeah, she she's did a, good work. An aspiring um, writer, too. Man, <laughs> yeah, she writes for Before We Go, actually. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, also, it is, it's it's nice that the, the youth are still enjoying the book. I'm, I'm feeling real old lately. <laughs> um, but um, I... That, that was that was a good question but it did have many parts mm -hmm. um there was a how do you get in the mindset but give me the first part again because um, i wanted to answer that right so she said it, um yeah you write so poetically in a style that feels both modern and timeless how do you get in the right mindset to create such artistic prose do you visualize the scenes in your mind like in a movie or some other approach cool um, <clears throat> I lied. I just wanted to hear that nice thing. And I did remember it. Um, it's, you know, it, interesting note. Um, when I wrote it and when I showed it to people, cause I, I, I gave it to people to read, to kind of get feedback mm -hmm. and to see how it was working. And, um, a lot of times people are like, your character says okay here and that's not really fantasy ish you know like and and i realized that kind of without i think initially i did make the choice it was a deliberate choice to not be like these and thous and sort of the the faux archaic you know language i appreciate um, it actually Yes, but, <laughs> Thank you but for it was that. <laughs> it was also it's sort of like in the same way if you go to the Ren Fair, everyone everyone suddenly gets a br bad British accent, um, which I mean is fair because it's it's fair and it's fine because it's all for fun. But and I'm like, you know, and if somebody's like if there's there what okay didn't exist back then and i'm like also there's no magic like where are you going to stop if what you're going for is pure realism i am not writing historical fiction you know and so you know theoretically i should write this entire book in another language you know because they don't speak english there like you know but then we end up with a clockwork uh orange scenario and nobody can read the book i've done weird modern art i haven't written a story mm -hmm. and so i did decide to have plain language 
language. I also did make deliberate choices. I like short sentences. Mm -hmm. I like um, short paragraphs. I want it to be snappy and easy to read um, and easy to understand because why would I make it hard on the reader? Um, and, and it'll sound weird for people. It's like, oh, a quarter million word novel. Obviously he values brevity, but I really do. Like I've cut so much out of that book and it's, it's really lean, uh, it's in terms of just actual word. Well, it's like every word serves a purpose. Like it's, it's yes. there both for the meaning, but it's also there for the style and the flow and the meter. Um, and it's just, everything is just, it's designed so well to be, you know, exactly what I believe you, that you intended it to be, right? To, to get, to reach that level of craft. I, everything I wanted to serve at least one purpose and hopefully several, yeah. you know? And so when I would cut things, I would, you know, I would cut things that were a little extra. If I said something mm -hmm. twice, I would cut the one that wasn't as good, um, Oh, and how about this? This is not advice, but I remember before we finally, no, it was for Wise Man's Fear. I went through and I did a search and I looked at every sentence with the word that in it, mm -hmm. because that is a filler word that if you're a good speaker and do conversational English, the word that is almost like a filler word. It provides mm -hmm. It's a spacer, mm -hmm. um, uh, but semantically it it doesn't do anything except like, you know, it's almost like a, a an um, it's a it's a not, mm -hmm. it's it's a not fumbling um, mm -hmm. um, but you don't need that in text, and so because I do sort of write a little more like a person speaks mm -hmm. um i went through and i looked at there were seven thousand of them in the book and i no no there was like there was about three or four thousand and i cut a third so i cut a thousand that's out of the book and which makes the book three pages shorter <laughs> and like nobody's ever gonna know Nobody is ever going to read the book and say, thanks, Pat, for giving me four minutes of my life back. Not have <laughs> nobody's going to say Rothfuss is good for the, you know, the ecosystem because he doesn't waste paper and ink with all those extra that's no reviewer is going to say. With the text remarkably absent of superfluous that, <laughs> you know, but I I pay attention to the language yeah. Uh, period. But I also do that because I love language. I sort of, ha I dabbled in poetry for a while and you learn things about the language when you're playing with poetry that you don't learn, play in other games. But, but honestly, I do not, well, that's not true. I, I, I mostly am trying to just make things sound good and be clear and I want it to to be easy for everyone because I there will be some times I want to do something else. And that's where I want the reader to be fresh and willing to put in a little work. Mm -hmm. Maybe to see sort of a little secret I've hidden, maybe to put up with a sentence like it was the patient cut flower sound of a man who is waiting to die. A sentence which semantically it makes, it says nothing. It makes no sense. Translators have apoplexy trying to deal with my stuff. What does it mean? And then I've got to explain it. And I'll be like, ah, yeah, it kind of implies some stuff and sounds cool, but technically it, and you know, so I don't set out to do some of what she said. It's more that I like language. I like the sound of language. And I think that uh, Robert Bly said that all these words have thousands of dead bodies hanging off of them. The meaning, the, the, the word that is in your mind, you know, some like somebody 
read that word on the day that their mother died. And it's that word is always going to have a shadow over it. Mm-hmm. But, and they had like a little, like a mandolin and he plucked a string and, and he goes, he goes, but the music goes straight for a person's heart and the sound of words is music. And that can sort of cut through all of those unavoidable entanglements that everyone brings that are different, but the sound of something that's nice, you know, that's, that's like built into our bones, you know, back when, you know, everything was just when, when our words were the sounds we made that made sense for the things we were talking about, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, And, and a nah, nah, nah. Well, and that, that means nurse, because that's the shape your mouth makes when you are, yeah. when you want to suck on a nipple, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. you know, uh, babies talk. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then we made it complicated. Uh, mm-hmm. But some of those complications can be arranged into beautiful patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, so I will say, if you want, how about this, if you want to write beautifully, mm-hmm. I would say, learn to write clearly Mm -hmm. and then make sure that you love language and you don't love beauty beauty is the goal Mm -hmm. but you know and then um think about whether or not you want um you know and and they mentioned effectively do you picture things i'm actually not big on imagery Mm -hmm. um but people think i am and i think it's because there's a little phrasings there that they like, but you know, like I don't describe people. Ooh, here, here's what it is. Uh, Half of more than half of doing it is not doing it Uh, or doing it a little bit and then walking away. I once had a guy, uh, this was back when I could hang out with people more. I went to a little con and then, got together with, there was a teacher and like four of his students that had come there and they were all like there. And and so we went out to dinner together and the one kid is sitting across from the table and he's like, he goes, the scene, this was just when Name of the Wind was out. He goes, that scene, he goes, where Kvothe like attacks the scrail. He's like, it was just so badass. He was so badass. And I'm like, I love that you love that scene. You have to give yourself some credit, though. You wrote that one, not me. I set up the scene. And then the person watching it, he gets knocked unconscious and he wakes up and he sees the aftermath. I didn't write that. Like you imagined what happened in between. And because you liked the setup and you saw what happened after, you did the coolest thing in between. And it was the coolest thing you could imagine. And it's perfectly suited to your taste. It's the same reason I described Fella as the most beautiful woman at the university. And everyone's like, ah. What is that? They're like, everyone has their own idea. Everyone knows what that (laughs) looks like. Whereas if I say, you know, and and there are a few markers like long hair, there's the implication that she's busty. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, everybody gets to do their own thing. Um, And so I, I try to do a little bit and then I get out of the reader's way mm-hmm. and that's hard. And that takes a lot of work and that I could probably teach a whole class on. But, um, but you know, I would say if you want to write something, if you find something in a book you like, figure out how they do it. And then rather than say, I want to do that, think, do I, do I want to do that? Do I want to do it that way? If you love language, play with language. That's what Tolkien did. He made languages. Mm-hmm. And also his writing was very adept. Um, but if you like imagery, then find authors who do good imagery. And that might be some of what you're noticing that you might think I'm doing, but I don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, people think I'm good at plot, but I'm not. I'm good at faking plot. Um, And and it it breaks my heart when they're like, oh, your plot's so good. And I'm like, shit, 
you're going to try to emulate this and you're going to have a problem. <laughs> um, it's like somebody said, Stephen King's a great writer. And they're like, don't try to copy Stephen King. What he's good at is words and characters. Yeah. yeah. But he's so good at them that you don't notice the other things he's not good at. So if you just try to copy his thing, it's not going to work. You got to find your own way. Find what you, you love find and find what you're thing. good at. Yeah. yeah. Find your own thing. That is really good advice.